to set up this idea, we're going to step into an encounter Jesus had, which is well known to us, in John 5, 1 to 15, I'll read to you from, to set up this idea from this particular passage here. And it says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Remember that statement, five covered colonnades. I'll come back to that with you. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Not the kind of question that you'd want to be asking a disabled person. Um, I imagine the tone, it's difficult sometimes, isn't it? Because you know, one of the worst things you can do in a regular mailing relationship is to assume a tone in the mail. The moment you decide there's a tone here, all the males from there go downhill. And so sometimes, because the Bible leaves you to decide the tone, I think it's worth us being imaginative and being thoughtful about the way in which he said that, because it sounds rude, it sounds offensive, it sounds not very politically correct to say to an invalid, do you want to get well? And I think what I want to say to you from that is if God is asking you something obvious, something not obvious is going on. Like, Adam, where are you? When God said, Adam, where are you? It's not because God couldn't find him. You know, God is omniscient and he, he's not struggling to find one individual on the earth. When God said, where are you? It's not because God couldn't find him. It's because Adam couldn't find himself. So there's something going on here that is, that is certainly beneath the surface and it's my job to try and find out what that is because there's something very, very significant happening here. Sir, the man replied to him, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, picked up his mat and walked. The title of this message, and I work hard on my titles because the, a good title, like a good title of a movie, or a book, or a TV show, or a song, or a sermon. The, the, the title is good if when you recall the title a week from now, a month from now, I meet people around the world that say to me, I remember you preached a message and they go back 20, 30 years. And that's why I'm committed to good titles. You know, in my masterclass this week with your teaching staff and so on, I said, a bad title is Fellowship Week 3. I think I'll stay home next week if it's Fellowship Week 4, is what we say to ourselves. It's worth investing in a good title. A good title is one that when you recall the title, the entire concept of the message is gathered up in the title. So you don't have to think about what did he speak about. The title effortlessly recalls what that person spoke about. So this title is called Step Out of Stuck. Step Out of Stuck. These Wellingtons, as we call them in England, you may not be from here and around the world, they're called different things, but you get the idea, gum boots or, or just boots, I suppose, but Wellingtons. My point is there's as much below the surface there as there is above the surface in those two stuck boots there in that terrible mud. And, and, and the idea I want to bring to you here is from this man's life because there's a place called Bethesda, okay? Bethesda apparently is a place where there was a pool of water and apparently an angel occur occasionally came and stirred that water, wherever that meant. The first sick person into that water got a miracle. Now we don't know whether or not anybody actually ever had got a miracle. We don't know of anybody in scripture that had that experience at Bethesda. But when you're desperate, the rumor is enough to make you spend your life there waiting for your turn. These are people who are so sick and so ill and so disabled that they have no other option but to physically be parked up in one space because this is the days, remember now, before prosthetics, before wheelchairs. In these days, and still in many cultures of the world, if you were disabled to the point where you couldn't move, 
then your life's options of movement and mobility are over. Here in the Western world, a disability is not the end of movement because we can assist people. This man lives in a time and an era and a culture where it's not an option. We read earlier, didn't we? There were many people, possibly hundreds of disabled people for whom this was the point of no return. This was the last chance they had at getting their life into a better place. And hundreds of them were stationary because that's all they could be around this pool of Bethesda. It's fabled. Apparently it has been told that if you are the first into the water when an angel stirs it, you will get a miracle. And so this man has been there longer than anyone else. The people at Bethesda, you have to think, must have known about Jesus. Any place that was involved in the miraculous where people are waiting for a miracle that came from heaven in the form of an angel, they must have known about this guy, Jesus. But the problem is, they can't go to where he is. Unless he comes to where they are, they'll never have an encounter with him. Jesus obviously knew about Bethesda because he's in the same business, I suppose, as these people are looking towards. So he enters Bethesda and he walks in and I guess Jesus made inquiries about what's happening around here and he made inquiries about this one and that one and someone said to him, you see that guy there, Jesus? He has been here longer than anybody else. This guy has been here 25, possibly 30 years. This guy has been here decades and typical of Jesus, he picks the worst case scenario. He walks up to this man that has been lying there for possibly decades and asks him this ridiculous question. But as I said, what seems to be going on is not what's going on. Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? After finding out he has not got well for decades, he asks him, do you want to get well? What's interesting is the man didn't say yes. So something is going on here in this man's mind and heart and life that's to do with this idea. This man is not just stuck physically. He is stuck mentally and emotionally and circumstantially and he's stuck relationally. This man and all the rest of them around Bethesda are totally stuck. And I want you to see tonight, I want you to think about this scripture and Bethesda different to how you've ever seen it before. Bethesda is a trap. Bethesda is a people trap. It is a place that promises something that it is failing to deliver. It is a place that is rigged for failure whilst promising those that are there a miracle, but the miracle is never coming. So when Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? Jesus is probing. He's inquiring for how much damage has Bethesda done to you? Is why he's asking him, do you want to get well? And I want you to see Bethesda Bethesda represents for us tonight in this message, it represents any place in your life where you have got stuck. Many of you here tonight, hundreds of you possibly here tonight, are stuck. I don't say that to artificially make this message seem more relevant than it is. I know this because statistically, around the world, and this is a very recent message for me, around the world, whenever I've asked the people to stand for prayer if they're comfortable to do that, as I will do tonight, who feel stuck. Hundreds in a service of this size stand. So stuck people are in every service. And I wonder what do we have to say to them? I wonder what do we have for them? And I'm looking at Jesus stepping into this scenario where hundreds of people are absolutely stuck and have nowhere else to go. And some of you feel like that tonight. And some of you have people on your minds that already you wish you were here, having heard what I've said already, people are on your minds that even today you were texting and talking to about this very issue of how stuck they feel in their life. Some of you are stuck relationally. Some of you are stuck in a job that you hate. Some of you are stuck in a health issue. Some of you are financially stuck. Some of you are stuck in a mindset that's not working for you. You are stuck. And this man is far more stuck than just his physical stuckness. And tonight I have come to be your getting unstuck coach. I've come to help you. I've come to help you to get unstuck because some of us here, and I have been here in my life. This isn't a, I have been stuck in my life at different times. 
didn't know I was. Because the problem with Bethesda is, Bethesda is a good place, apparently. Bethesda is a place where miracles happen. So who's gonna, who's gonna suspect that this is a trap? It draws you in with the promise of breakthrough and the promise of change. Bethesda over promises, actually. And it promises that it could be your turn next. And yet, because it promises good things can happen and because apparently good things do happen and because miracles happen, you don't suspect anything here could possibly be negative. And this is what Jesus is trying to show us from Bethesda. Because when he says to the man, do you want to get well? Here's what he said to Jesus. Here's what he must have said in his mind for his answer to be what it was. Well, clearly you must be new around here. Let me explain to you how things work. He didn't say to him, yes, lay your hand on me. I've heard about you. I'm glad you came. Didn't say that. You would think someone as desperate as him would have, would have said, yes, I want to get well. Help me. He didn't. He simply said to Jesus, let me educate you about what happens around here. And he said to Jesus, once a year, an angel stirs the water, and one of us, once a year, gets in the water. And the first one in gets a miracle. And see, my problem is, Jesus, I am so far back from the pool. And I don't have friends that will hang out with me 24-7 to assist me when the angel randomly appears. It could be midnight. It could be 3 in the morning. And, and if I can't get to the pool by myself, and I can't, I'm never going to get into the pool. Some people that have been here for years, too, have friends and family that take shifts and been here with them. Just in case when the angel comes, they're gonna make sure their loved one gets in the pool first. I kinda of don't have connections like that. So I'm limited in it being my turn. And so I suppose next to the pool were all these people that were so close to the pool, like the Germans with their towels on the beaches. Huh? You thought you got up early to beat the crowd and they're already there. It's like a conveyor belt at the airport. You can't see your backs because everybody's like here waiting for theirs, I suppose was the poolside. So we couldn't even see the water, let alone think of planning a route to it if the angel stirred it. So he says to Jesus, you see, I've been here a long time and the reason I'm not healed is because when the angel comes, I have no one to help me to get into the water. In other words, he said to Jesus, here we have a system. And the system works that way. And as he's telling this to Jesus, instead of saying, yes, I want to get healed, he said to Jesus, we have a system. In other words, when you get a system, when your stuckness, when your stuckness becomes subject to a system, a system organizes your stuckness. This man is in highly organized stuckness, and so are some of you. Because when God says to you, when someone says to you and asks you, your friends, your family, your loved ones who know you're stuck, when they ask you a simple question, you're almost offended at how simplistic they seem to think your problem is. So often we do what this man does. We answer people in a complicated way to a simple question as if we're saying to them, you know what, I wish it was that easy. It's just not. Let me tell you how difficult my life is. Let me tell you how complicated my stuckness is. This is what the man did. Do you want to get well? There's a system here. And some of you have a system, and a system organizes your problem, and some of you have highly organized problems. Didn't start that way. But the longer this problem persists in your life and becomes embedded in your personality and embedded in your habits of life, it becomes now a system in your life that you respond to and live inside every single day and you can't see it because you're inside it. It's a blind spot. A blind spot is this. A blind spot is when someone knows something about you, you don't know about yourself because you can't see it. And Jesus comes free from the blind spot of, of the Bethesda trap and says to him, do you want to get well? Because to Jesus, it's a simple question and a simple answer. Some of you have highly organized worry. Some of you have highly organized stress. Some of you have highly organized shame. Some of you have highly organized regret and fear and guilt and failure. Some of you have 
highly organized drama in your life. Some of you have highly organized financial problems that are negatively destroying and eating away at your life. It's when it becomes a system, a system organizes your problem. And this man's disability is stuck internally and externally because he surrendered it to a system. When Jesus said, get up and walk, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, by the way, you could have done this anytime. It feels like that to me. It's like it feels like Jesus is saying, you could have gone home anytime, you know. But you are so... You are so trapped by the system, you are so stuck that you can't see how easy it is to step out of it. Not only, not only is he, has he got organized disability, organized stuckness like many of us often do in life, but he also has a cultural support group. His cultural support group are the people lying next to him at the pool. If you've ever been sick for any period of time in your life, weeks or months, and some of you are now sick and have been sick for a while or have loved ones that are not here that are on your mind as I say that. Whenever you're sick for any length of time, it's amazing how your whole life becomes about that sickness. All your phone calls and your mails, how are you? You think, don't ask me how I am. I'm so tired of saying how I am. All becomes out of prescription and your symptoms and how did you sleep? What did the doctor say? What did the specialist say? And your whole life becomes a conversation about your sickness and your symptoms and you hate it. But what happens is eventually, the longer this goes on, and that could be like for three or four weeks, imagine 30 years. Imagine, imagine spending all your life in this position, because this is these people. These people, these people were never upright. Probably these people were never on their feet because their disability meant that all they could do was lie down. Imagine spending decades of your life in this position, only relating to people that also were trapped in that position. Imagine what that must do to your, to your psychology, to your physiology to your limbs, to your mind, to your emotions, that you are stuck in this position and you roll over and speak to the other people that are also in the same trap as you and all your relationships, all your culture that you do life with, the people you do life with are just as stuck as you. Every day we just talk about how stuck we are, about when our turn will come, about will the angel come today, what will happen if he does. People were dying every single day around him. Many of his friends were not there anymore. They'd passed away years earlier whilst waiting. He's resigned to this fate for himself. So not only is he in a system that organizes his problem, he has a cultural support group. And when you have a cultural support group, not only are you organized in your worry, now your support group is supporting your problem. Many of you have a supported problem because the longer you stay in your problem, the more you screen out people who try to help you. Because you see them as an irritation. And you get used to talking about it and you presume and assume that people's interest in your problem is sympathy and empathy. And actually, it's contributing to you keeping stuck. You long for a conversation that doesn't include your stuckness, but you eventually finish up creating a group of friends that are as stuck as you are. And now we have friends that we worry with. It's group worry. Now we have friends that when you tell them how stressed you are, they say, are you kidding? That's nothing. Listen to my week. <laughs> because misery loves company. And so now you have a cultural support group, everybody's behaving, and that's what culture is. Culture is the way that we behave. And so everybody's behaving the same way. That's who you do life with. So this man's stuckness is because he's stuck in a system that organizes his disability and his stuckness. Now he has a cultural support group that are supporting his problem every single day, and he's supporting theirs. Not only that, but he is also stuck structurally. Remember, the five colonnades. Now, because I don't think colonnades has been a recent part of any of your discussions, I was thinking about colonnades today, were you? Uh, no. <laughs> colonnades is not a contemporary word and there would therefore not be a common conversation, so you may not know what a colonnade is, so I've got a picture of one. You'll recognize this is part of the ancient architecture all across Europe 
and the Middle East, you'll see these. Colonnades were the modern day equivalent of air conditioning. Colonnades were built for shade in an outdoor life community because this is where you had your coffee, met your friends, hung out, met with, took out family and friends, did business, commerce. You did it in these colonnades. Colonnades were built for shade. They were a genius piece of architecture because wherever the sun was in the day, a part of this would always be in shade. You'd move through the colonnade to stay in the shaded part if you had to do life outdoors. And of course, this is an outdoor world. There was no indoor option for cooling like we have now. So colonnades were shade and protection. It's a structure to offer shade. So think with me now. This guy's at Bethesda. His disability is highly organized in a system. It's supported by the people around him who are stuck as he is. Not only that, there are five covered colonnades. The colonnades are offering shade while you wait. They are making your waiting comfortable. The colonnades are saying to you, you can stay here long term. We are built for long term purpose. We are built so people like you don't get sunstroke, don't get burnt. And so around this water are these beautiful colonnades. So this man is not only trapped in a system and trapped in a culture, he is trapped in a structure that is sheltering his problem, sheltering his disability, sheltering his stuckness. And many of us have colonnades in the mind. Some of us have structural stuckness. Once it becomes structural stuckness, it becomes a whole part of how you think. It becomes a mindset and a belief system. And in many parts of the world, those mindsets and belief systems go further and become policy and become rule of law like apartheid. Apartheid was a structural establishing of what first of all was a system then it was a culture supported by whites in South Africa that were oppressing the blacks. And then eventually it becomes policy and legislation. It's backed by law and government. Now it's a structure that's shading that wrong thing, that's shading and protecting that wrong thing that should never have happened. This is true all across the world where there are structures that are established all around the world that are destroying people's lives. But these governments are are abusing and dictating and locking up their people. This is where Syria came from. Because the Syrian people, the millennials in Syria and in Egypt and in, and in Libya, all these North African countries in the Arab Spring of 2011 said we've had enough of a structure that's killing us. We no longer want leaders who do not serve us. And so they went to the streets and protested and hundreds of thousands of them lost their lives. Because they realize it is not only a system and a culture, it is now a structural established idea in those countries to oppress them. And some of us have these structures in our minds and the church is full of these structures. Churches that have structures that shelter and protect our religiosity, that protect our sacred cows, that protect our narrow-mindedness and protect our judgmentalness and our finger-wagging at the world and protect our fragility and how threatened we are by difference. Churches all around the world have a theology. Once your structure gets a theology, you feel it's God. Then we wonder why 98% of our country are not in church. Because we have built structures, we built colonnades in our own organizations that, that legitimize us being like we are. And I want to say to some of you tonight that you are, you are stuck and you have so well supported stuckness and you have highly organized and highly structured problems. But I want you to know that tonight you can, you can step out of stuck. I want you to know that Bethesda is rigged for failure. Because one person once a year, how crummy is that? It's rigged against you. That's even if you are next to the pool, it's rigged against you. One person once a year, so when Jesus said, you want to get well? And he said, here's the system. He couldn't even, couldn't even hear himself saying, why am I even here? And Jesus said to him, I want you to step out of that stuck life that you are in. I want you tonight to consider, before you leave this room, stepping out of your stuckness, your stuck relationships, friendships, roles, locations, jobs, 
Whatever you feel in life, you're stuck tonight, and it's become what I'm describing, organized, and it's cultural support group, and it's, you're so stuck inside, and you don't want to finish this year and go into 2018 more stuck than you've been in the previous years. You are sick and tired of being stuck, is what I want you to get. I want you to get some, I want you to get, listen to me, I want you to get some of that, oh, I'm so fed up with this thing. I'm so, you gotta find some of that, guys. This guy's gotta find it. I want you to find some aggression, some assertiveness, some strength, some, I have, I have had enough. And listen, don't look for big things. I got sick and tired of praying for people in the prayer line who came for a problem and the problem was only the tip of the iceberg of their stuckness. And when people come for prayer and walk away no better off, they somehow think that God is failing them. And the truth is that it's nothing to do with the prayer line, and I'm all for praying for people, but if you are stuck psychologically, emotionally, relationally, culturally, structurally, if your stuckness is so established, a prayer won't help you. All you can do, and this is what this guy's got to figure out, and we have to, your miracle is not at Bethesda. Your miracle is in leaving Bethesda. That's why Jesus said to him, get out of here. Huh. You need to get out of here. And the guy, it never occurred to him that the miracle would not be there because everybody there is waiting for the miracle. It can only be there, waiting for better days to come and the better days are not coming. And Jesus said, leave the system. This is why God had to say to Abraham and to Joseph and to David and to Jesus, you have to leave where you are for me to use you. Abraham, you gotta get out of the stuckness. Leave your family, leave your homeland. Joseph, get away from your brothers who despise you, who see nothing worthwhile in you. Jesus had to leave Nazareth, David. All of these characters, until God could get them to move from their stuckness, he couldn't use them. Some of you, until, until you move from your stuckness, God can't even get done through you what he wants to do for you next. You want the next thing, but the next thing can't come to where you are. The next thing's gonna be wasted at Bethesda. So Jesus is saying, you gotta leave this place. You gotta get up and walk away from Bethesda if you want a miracle. And it starts simple. Take a simple step. Let me have my boots back up here. Now, look at this. This is where someone was stuck. Supposing that's a picture of you and you stood inside those boots. Supposing I... I'm on the dry ground a few meters away, shouting to you, you're sinking. Step out, get out of there. And you'd say to me, I can't, can't you see? I'm stuck. Why are you saying to me, get out of there? Can't you see I'm stuck and I'm getting more and more stuck. The more I struggle, the more I'm sinking and getting stuck is this man's life. And I'm gonna say to you, leave your boots. Step out of your boots because here's what happens. The longer you stay in those boots, you think you and your boots are the same thing. You get so attached to your boots, you don't realize, listen to me, it's not you that's stuck. It's not this man that's stuck. It's the system that's sticking you. It's the culture that's holding you. It's the friends, it's the friends you need to walk away from. It's the structure you need to walk away from. You are not stuck, you're okay, you're okay. But what you're involved in, or what you've surrendered your initiative and your strength to is what's making you stuck. So you gotta leave your boots and the thought, the fear of putting a bare socked foot into that mess freaks some of you out. And you think, what do you mean I can't step out of my boots? My boots are my protection, my insulation from the problem. But your boots are the problem. And so you have to be willing, Jesus said, take up your mat. Sometimes you gotta leave your mat. Leave your mat, leave your boots, leave what you invested, leave those people behind, leave that system, leave that circle of friends, leave that mindset, leave that emotional dependency, leave it. You've got to step away from what's holding you and reinvent yourself. You might say, well, I put a lot of time into that relationship, put a lot of money into that business deal. Yeah, I know, but it's gone bad and it's getting worse and it's not getting better. And so perhaps you need to draw a line, step out of your stuck and walk away. And it's not big things. Some of you just need to, some of you just need to, before you go to bed tonight, delete yourself from the family WhatsApp channel. Starts there. 
got to say, I'm not, I'm done with it. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm sick of the gossip. I'm sick of the negativity. I'm sick of the, 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 the harshness, the rudeness, the abrasiveness. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm not doing it. It starts there. It starts with not returning the phone call this week. When that person calls you who wants to vent and rant at you, it starts there. Starts with you taking a little bit, a little bit, just a little bit. If you could just take one little step, that, that first little step, it's not dramatic. You're still too near Bethesda than free, but it's a step, it's a beginning. Get up and take a step tonight. Do something, a little thing. Say, I've had enough. No, you know, we sing, don't we? Tell the devil not today. But listen to me, the devil don't mind you singing that when you're stuck. You say, tell the devil not today, and the devil goes, sing it all you like. You are so stuck. Sing it all you like. Singing it won't get you unstuck. And so you're saying, you're saying in the worship, tell the devil not today. And then you're involved in mailing with people that's killing you. And the devil's like, great. Ha, ha. You're in a system. You're so stuck. Go ahead. Sing your head off. Tell the devil not today. You're saying that. And then with your life, you're going, yeah, come on, devil. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. It doesn't say, it doesn't say, assist the devil. Some of you are brilliant devil assisters. Some of you are putting the devil out of work. He's like, you can do this all by yourself. You know, to some Christians, honestly, to some Christians, we have to say, come out of that demon and leave it alone. <laughs> leave that demon alone. The demon's fed up of you. Even the demon's saying to Jesus, Jesus, you know it's not me, don't you? And Jesus says, I know it's not you. I know it's not you. I know it's them. Maybe we should have services. Maybe we should have services to deliver, to deliver demons from Christians. I want you to get... I want somebody this week to stop being polite. Stop it. Stop being polite. I want you this week to be rude. I want you to risk, because people said to you, that's so rude, and so you bow down again. I want you to decide, okay, I'm going to have to suffer you thinking I'm rude. Um, if that's the worst it gets, and that's the price of my stuckness, that you think I'm rude, then I'm going to go ahead and risk you thinking I'm rude. But I'm going to say, no, don't call me, don't talk to me, don't come around anymore. I'm going to have to risk that. Get, get some of that. Get some of that energy in you this week. Find your strength. Find that Find that mojo that you lost. Find that, that aggressiveness. Find that no, not me, not now, not today. Just a little bit, just even a little thing that you can do. If you do one thing tonight, one thing tomorrow, one thing the next day, if you every day this week do one little thing that gets you unstuck, I promise you, a few weeks from now, your life, before the end of this year, your life will get free from your Bethesda and you are totally set up for the next level for this new coming year. But God can't do it for you. And so God is saying to you tonight, God is saying to you, do you want to get well? Don't say to him, I'm in a system, excuse me. Say to him, yeah, I want to get well. I'm sick of it. When he says get up and walk, do something. I've got to finish, but I've got to tell you. <laughs> this is what happens. He gets his mat and he's leaving Bethesda. What's the first thing that happens? He meets a Pharisee who says to him, Oi, it's the Sabbath. Here comes another system, boom. He just got free of a 30 year system, cutting his mat. Here comes a religious person saying to him, that's not allowed on the Sabbath, put that mat down. Who told you to do that? Here comes another system, watch for that. You're gonna step away from something that's killing you and someone's gonna put another one on you. Straight away, watch for it, expect it. Because people, people that have a vested interest in you not getting free, if they see you getting free and they're afraid they will not have the same place in your life, they're afraid they will not have the same influence over you, they're scared of you getting free, they don't want you to get bulgy, they don't want you to get aggressive and strong. They like you like you are because they have a certain control in your life. So here comes the next one. Who told you? And the guy says, I don't know. How cool is Jesus? Didn't even give him his name. What about it on BBC? guy says I don't know the guy's name I, I, he never even told me this guy's got a miracle after decades Jesus never said by the way here's my name here's my card come to my church next week I'll put you on camera it'll increase our offering how cool is Jesus then he says later 
Jesus finds him in the temple and says to him, listen, heads up, let me help you. Go and sin no more in case something worse happens. Whoa, hang on, hang on. Go and sin no more for crying out loud. The guy is a cripple. What kind of sins has he been up to? He's not exactly the man about town, is he? He's not going around gambling, drug dealing, sleeping around. The guy is an invalid. What do you mean sin no more? Remember, if something obvious has been said, something not obvious is going on. Perhaps the greatest sin of that man and of us is surrendering your life to a system that steals your future and steals your freedom. Maybe that's the sin that he said. Don't do that anymore. Don't surrender your life anymore to people and systems and cultures that rob you of your future. Let's stand together. Come on, we gotta go. Let's stand. I want you all across the room. Just where you are, just all across the room. If you feel tonight, this is me, I just, I feel I'm stuck. And I want to make a decision tonight to get unstuck. I'm so done with it. Will you just lift your hand where you are tonight? And I just want to pray for you. If you don't want to lift your hand, that's cool. Lifting a hand and not lifting a hand doesn't include or exclude you. Because God sees everyone's heart. But if you just want to lift a hand, come on, all across the room. Hundreds of you. God help us. So much lost potential. So much delay and postponement in all of your lives. We need you free. Father, I pray for every person here lifting a hand. Those later listening to this podcast that also feel stuck. I pray for, we pray for all of you that from this moment onwards, you will find the courage, the strength, the tenacity, the goal, the audacity to take a step away from your Bethesda. I pray tonight will be a beginning that never ever stops, that you will take a step that will never stop, that you will take step after step after step this week. Turn your back on Bethesda. Turn your back on your stuckness. I pray that from tonight, you will begin to step out of your stuckness in the name of Jesus. Do it. Do it tonight, do it with all of your heart and step into a whole new beginning for your life and for your future. In the name of Jesus, step out of stuck. Amen. Come on, let's welcome this decision of these people. We honor you, we salute you. It's not easy, but we pray for you. 